Welcome back. It's good to see you again. It's time for uh, chapter three and our overview. I went ahead and put up the uh, web page from the textbook for chapter three, and I just want to point out that it it focuses on personalities. We've got before Copernicus, Aristotle, the Copernican Revolution. We've got Tycho Brahe. We've got Kepler and Kepler's laws and so on, and then Galileo and Newton. So really, the story of chapter 3 is told through these various personalities that played a role in the development of modern astronomy. But I can't go through every single one of these guys in detail because that would take an hour probably. I want to focus on the things that generally cause the most trouble and more practically, are related to the homework assignment in a direct way. So what I really want to do is to start with Kepler, and in particular Kepler's three laws. So um, let me point out that this is all described in the textbook. There are pictures of ellipses and what it all means and so on. But I've actually cooked up some slides here, which I think might also help. So let me go ahead and, and run through those so you guys get an idea of, of what that's about. So, um, first of all, the, uh, the main three things we're going to be dealing with in this chapter with regard to the homework and, and the material that we use throughout the rest of the course are the big three. Kepler's three laws, Newton's three laws, and Newton's universal law of gravitation. So let me start with Kepler's laws. First of all, Kepler realized that... Um, by looking at a lot of data that was collected by his uh, prior employer, Tycho Brahe, uh, he analyzed a lot of data and realized, he was the first to realize, that planetary orbits are actually elliptical, not circular. Aristotle was stuck on circles, Copernicus adopted circles, Tycho Brahe pretty much believed in the circle thing, and uh, it was Kepler who really came, broke the mold and decided that or at least discovered, I guess, would be a better way to describe it, that uh, elliptical orbits were a better description of what planets actually did than circular orbits. So the idea is that uh, planets move in ellipses, and hang on one second. <clears throat> and the sun is at one focus of the ellipse, not only that, when they move in an elliptical orbit, let me go back so you can see that again. The sun is at one focus, and when the planet moves, it sweeps out an equal area in equal time. So if it's close to the sun, it sweeps out an area very quickly, and if it's far from the sun, it goes much more slowly in such a way that it sweeps out equal areas in equal time. So that, what that basically means is the planets go fast when they're close to the sun, and they go slower when they're far from the sun. Finally, the third law, I guess, is probably the most important for us, and that is the relationship between the average distance between the planet and the sun. <coughs> Excuse me. The time it takes to go around and the mass of the sun, in this case, uh, when we start dealing with systems with more than one star, like binary star systems, or we deal with systems where you have planets with a lot of mass, so that their mass becomes comparable to the sun's, the star's mass, this mass here is going to turn out to be the sum of uh, one object and the other. It's the total mass of the system. This number here, the average distance between the two, the average separation, is also called the semi-major axis. And if you, uh, if we go back Let's see, if we go back to the web page um, and look at the pictures of the ellipses here, the semi-major axis is, the major axis is this axis this way, the semi-major axis is half of that. And here we have an exaggerated example of equal areas. Here we have a, an object going fast when it's close to the sun and then going slow when it's far from the sun in such a way that this area and this area are actually the same. Okay, so there we have it, and uh, let's go back to our slides here. 
The other thing is uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation so and Newton's three laws of motion. So the first law of motion is inertia, which says things keep going the way they were going if they can. And uh, if, they, if there's no net force acting on a body, it'll just keep moving in a straight line at a constant speed. If there is a net force, it'll have a rate of change of velocity that will depend on the net force. And finally, the third law is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the sun can't pull on the earth without the earth pulling back on the sun with an equal and opposite force. And that turns out to be important when we start looking at exoplanets. And finally, the universal law of gravitation, which has a horrific formula, which I'll talk more about here in a minute. But basically it says that the force between two objects, the force of gravitation between two objects, is equal to the product of their masses divided by the separation between the two bodies squared times this universal constant g, the universal constant of gravitation. And this little r hat guy just tells us which way the force points. The force, of course, always points in a direction to make the force attractive. Gravity is always an attractive force. And that's it for now. I'm going to do a couple of examples now so you guys can see sort of how this thing works. All right. So I want to work out a couple of examples here using the ideas from Chapter 3. So one would be, let's say you want to design a flight from Earth to Mars. So, you know, Earth goes around in an orbit, something like this. And then Mars is in an orbit, another elliptical orbit, something like that. Now the Earth's orbit is one astronomical unit from the Sun. Mars's orbit is about 1.5. And the question is, what would be the most efficient way to make an orbit that goes from the Earth to Mars? Well, it turns out the easiest, the cheapest way is to put a spacecraft on an orbit that is naturally one that goes between the two orbits of Earth and Mars. In other words, it would be an elliptical orbit that starts at Earth's orbit and then goes out to Mars's orbit and back to Earth's orbit like that. That way it could coast the entire way. All you have to do is get it going on that orbit and it would simply coast the whole way, all the way from Earth out to Mars. And then it could just match up with Mars's orbit and land expending very little uh, energy. What would be the semi-major axis of such an ellipse? So let's think about that. We go from here to here. So it's one and a half astronomical units on this side and one astronomical unit on this side. So that makes it a half of one plus one and a half. So one plus one and a half divided by 2, right? So that's 2.5 divided by 2, or 1.25 astronomical units. Now, I can take the handy-dandy Okay, so we have thecalc.com. I'm going to type in astronomy calculator into the search box. I get Astronomy Calculator, Steve Spicklemeyer, that's me, S-S-P-I-C-K-L-E, so that's my guy, so we'll click on that one, and uh, you'll notice there's a bunch of calculators here. The one we're interested in is period from, period from mass and separation. We're looking for the period, we know the mass, and we know the separation. So the mass is, of course, um, one solar mass, so I'll go ahead and select that. Boom. And the separation is 1.25 astronomical units. It gives me a whole bunch of seconds, but I'd really rather see that in years, so I'll come down here and select years. It's like about 1.4 years. But of course, remember, we only want the time it takes to go from the Earth to Mars. That's only half of the orbit, not all the way back around to Earth again. So I guess that's going to turn out to be 0.7 years. Or if we put that in months, it'll be half of 
16 point eight or seventeen months I guess so that's like eight and a half months is what that's gonna boil down to. So that's the way that works. I should point out one other thing that's here while I'm here, and that is the speed of circular motion calculator. That's a handy one. If you want to know the speed of an orbit and you know the radius of the orbit and the period of the orbit, you can use this guy. If it's a circular orbit, you can use this guy to calculate the speed. So for example, if you know the period is uh, one year, so we'll go ahead and put in one year as the period, and if you know the radius is one astronomical unit, so this would be, where do we got there, where astronomical unit, that tells you the speed, that's actually the speed of the Earth going around the Sun, roughly 30,000 meters per second, or you could put that in kilometers per second, or you could put it in kilometers per hour, whatever. Uh, miles per hour. There's all kinds of, let's see, surely we have miles per hour here. Yeah, boom, miles per hour. 66, 67,000 miles an hour. Anyway, uh, that can be useful, and in fact, one of the homework problems is going to be uh, asking you to use this guy, basically. All right. Say, I want to compare the gravity on Earth and the Moon. Uh, the easy way to do that is to write out the universal law of gravitation for the Earth. It has a magnitude that's g times the mass of my object, say a, a test mass of some kind, times the mass of the Earth, divided by the radius of the Earth squared. I want to compare that to the force of gravity on the Moon. So that's the same gravitational constant, the same test mass. The mass of the moon now divided by the radius of the moon squared. And I'll take the ratio of these two guys. Now, when I take the ratio, the lovely thing is the things that are the same in these two guys cancel. So the universal gravitational constant and the mass of my test mass cancel. And I end up with just a ratio of the mass of the two bodies that I'm standing on, say, and then the radius of the two bodies. So I get the ratio of the forces, force on the Earth compared to the force on the Moon, is just the ratio of the mass of the Earth to the mass of the Moon times the corresponding ratio of the radii. But notice it's a 1 over r squared, so it's going to be the radius of the Moon squared divided by the radius of the Earth squared, like that. Hey guys, I wanted to point out one other thing real quick, and that is that when you have a... Well, hang on a second. When you have an expression like this, mass is a cubed over t squared, it looks scary and everything, but I want to point out that on the astronomy calculator, this thing is solved all three ways. So, for example, hang on one second. Let's see, can I make this? Uh, okay. We're going to get there. Okay. Just trust me. All right. Maybe we won't. Here we go. Yes. Okay. And get everything on the screen at the same time. <clears throat> so I've got mass in terms of uh, semi-major axis and period. Semi-major axis I also called separation because in the case of the Sun and the Earth it's the average separation between the two bodies is the semi-major axis. Um, when we're talking about a spaceship going from Earth to Mars, however, that's the average distance from the Sun of the spacecraft, not of Earth or Mars, it's it's average, averaging 1.25 astronomical units. Even though the Earth is at 1 and Mars is at 1.5, the spacecraft on the average of this elliptical orbit that goes between the two orbits is 1.25. Does that make sense? So the point is, you could solve for mass in terms of separation and period. Well, we've got that. That's this top guy. You could solve for period in terms of 
in terms of mass and and mass and separation, that's the second guy. And then you could solve for separation in terms of mass and period, that's the third guy. So whichever way you need to solve this guy, there's a calculator set up, like if you need separation and you've got the other two, then you come over to this one and you go boom, um, that's it. And you type in the period, you type in the mass, and out comes the separation. On the other hand, if what you need is uh, separate, let's see. If you need period, you solve it with this one. Out comes the period. And you just choose the units you need. If you don't like seconds, you want months, boom, get it in months. Okay? So hopefully that helps. Look, this is not supposed to be hideously difficult. If you feel like it is, then you need to ask questions because uh, I think you're probably overcomplicating it and uh, we just need to talk. So anyway, I hope that helps. We'll talk to you guys.